Saint Dionysius is a saint of forgiveness. Here you had a man raised by pious, devout parents, a wonderful brother, a wonderful sister, who for the most part, Saint Dionysius lived a, a relatively peaceful life. There were times of tragedy and crisis in his life. And this is where the, the saint shines through. And, and this is where any, actually any, any one of us shines through, is a moment of crisis, not during the good times, but the tragic times where we are really put at the test. It, it's easy to be a, a good Christian when times are easy, but to be Christ-like in tragic, horrible, evil circumstances is the greatest test and challenge and point of our character. Saint Dionysius was born in 1547 on the island of Zakynthos. His parents were very devout Christians. They raised him as a devout Christian. To have a saint that was born in modern day times, modern day times being three, four, five hundred years ago, is a wonderful event because it makes it real for us in our own lives. Saint Dionysius, his godfather, was a saint, Saint Erasmus of Kefalonia. His father, Saint Dionysius' father, hired uh, a pious, learned, Orthodox Christian teacher to uh, instruct, educate the young Dionysius. There is in fact a contract signed by both the teacher and the saint's father dated 1557 that unfortunately was burnt in a fire in 1953. Saint Dionysius had a brother named Constantine and a sister named Segura. And the reason I mention this is because they're gonna play a very important part in his life later on. During his teens, St. Dionysius' parents pass away, leaving a great inheritance to his sister and his brother and himself. I think you see a lot of common threads running through some of the lives of the saints. Uh, a lot of them come from wealthy backgrounds. A lot of them uh, lose their parents at early ages. And I think you see this running through a lot of their lives. And I think it does lead to their eventual calling and perhaps their ability to answer the calling. This young devout Christian, only a teenager, experienced the death of his parents. He decided that the monastic life was to be his direction. He gave all the possessions that his parents had to his sister and his brother and retreated to the monastery. The first time I entered a monastery, in a way it's kind of like being in a different world. It's such a shock to the system at first because we're used to people, cars, coming and going as you want, noise. But when you went to a monastery, it's a total departure from anything that you've seen in the world. Dionysius definitely moves away from anything that's worldly. And his whole focus is not on glory, not on fame, not on possessions, but rather his connections with God. He ended up being offered the monastery of Our Lady of Anaforitria. And about a year later, the bishop ordained him a priest even though he thought being a priest was, uh, um, was above him and beyond his capabilities. Dionysius, as a monk, wanted to visit the Holy Lands, and he was going through Athens in order probably to get a ship from, from the port there, probably paid his respects to the Archbishop of Athens at the time. The Archbishop is so taken aback by the holiness the spirituality and just the person of the Onesius that he appoints him rather to become bishop of the see at Aegina. Aegina was a very prominent uh, island off the east coast of the Peloponnesus and the Onesius accepted that honor. In the Sea of Aegina or wherever Dionysius had pastoral ministry, he was beloved by his entire flock. He was one that was with them constantly. He loved to serve. He was with them for their joyous occasions, for the sad occasions, with them constantly preaching, teaching, counseling, and being with them. The people, in fact, even honor St. Dionysius to this day. In a village very near the port in Aegina, there's a great cathedral that bears the stone throne that Dionysius sat on during his reign as Archbishop. What happens with someone like that is that you become very, very popular. People not only from Aegina, but from the surrounding islands, from the mainland, flocked to Aegina to see this very holy, pious, kind, and loving man. Saint Dionysius became concerned in time 
that this fame would be his downfall. He resigned there because he didn't want to have so much attention drawn to himself and he wanted to go back to his monastic lifestyle. The monastic thinking is that way, where you don't praise anyone. I remember when I was at a monastery in Greece and I went up and I told the monks after they had got done chant, finished chanting, and I said, that was very beautiful, and they got mad at me. They said, now you know what I have to do? I have to go pray to God because you put the sin of pride on my shoulders by praising me. And I was taken back by that because I didn't think of it that way, but it's true. They're fighting constantly, people that are holy, to fight this issue of pride, that when you give them a compliment, Satan may take this compliment and work it against them, saying, yeah, you know, maybe I am good. He resigns, he returns to Zakynthos, but because of his tremendous abilities, was immediately given a post as, a, as bishop in Zakynthos. He, just as he did on the island of Eyna, loved the people there, was a wonderful administrator, educator, ordained priest, and administered the affairs of his diocese quite well. He ordained clergy, he presided at festivals, he, um, he performed the sacraments, but when he did all this for the people, he didn't accept any money. Dionysius would not accept money from people for whatever priestly services he would have offered, and this became an issue. The Bishop of Caponia, when he performed all these services, presiding at festivals, the sacraments and so forth, the faithful would offer him money and he wouldn't accept it. And he was hearing from the people, why should you get money? The priest in the other place doesn't ask for anything. They kind of put him on the spot. And so he was, by comparison, uh, left in a very uncomfortable position. And he wanted to curb the Onusius from what he was doing. So he's brought before a spiritual court and instead of confronting and defending himself, he resigns, showing his humility, his humbleness. He's that kind of a humble man. He says, well, you know, if he wants to make an issue of it, I'll just leave. I'm not going to sit and fight for it. St. Dionysius, not wishing to cause controversy or scandal, resigns then humbly as Bishop of Zakynthos and goes to the monastery of the Theotokos, Anaphonitria. There, he is made elder, abbot, of the monastery by the monastics there. He watches over the monks, he presides over the services. He's almost like the bishop of the monastery. Little did he know that the event about to take place would become his epitaph. It seems that the, uh, um, the saint came from a family, the Sugaras, Sugaras family, and uh, there was another family called the Melanos family. And it seems like they both were fighting each other. It was like a present day Hatfields and McCoys type of feud. And actually it was a pretty bad feud because there was people killed on both sides. One night there's a knock at the monastery doors. The monks of the monastery bring to the abbot, St. Dionysius, this man who is out of breath. And the man said, I have sinned greatly and I need to be forgiven. I need confession. And he let him in and he cleaned him up and gave him something to eat and tried to talk to him and find out what this was all about and the man admitted that he had just killed somebody. At the same time, as the confession's being heard by the saint, there's more pounding at the door. The authorities and the saint's family who have been chasing after the murderer are now at the monastery doors. Upon further questioning, Saint Dionysius found, finds out that he's from the Melanos family, which was the family that was feuding with the family of Saint Dionysius. And he finds out eventually the person he has killed turns out to be his brother, Constantine. And the criminal, the murderer, did not know that he was confessing to the brother of who he had just killed. The authorities and St. Dionysius' family comes in and explains to the saint why they are present, that they have been searching the island trying to find the murderer of his brother. And by chance, has St. Dionysius seen him? Has he come here? Has he, has he heard where the murderer may be hiding? St. Dionysius not only does not reveal to them where the murderer is there, but directs them in the opposite direction. After the authorities and his family have left, St. Dionysius gives the man food and provides him with a boat. 
But before he even sets the man on his way, he does something even greater. St. Dionysius does something even greater than providing an escape route for the man. He reads the prayer of absolution. He forgives his brother's murderer and then sets him free. He has the man taken out of the back door of the monastery where he has arranged for a boat, for money, for food, and provisions to help the man escape. So it's not just a question he gives him an opportunity to escape, but he gives him the means to escape, which I think touches deeply on how forgiving the Onesius was. It wasn't as if he let him out in the back door, okay, you're on your own, but he ensured his escape. Imagine the difficulties of the confessor wearing the epitrahilion with the fringe on the bottom are the souls of the people you are responsible for, knowing that his soul was responsible for the soul of this man who came to him to be forgiven. The human versus the divine. Again, like so many of our saints, the divine rises to the occasion. He forgives the man. Saint Dionysius remained then throughout the rest of his life as the abbot of the monastery of the Theotokos until he died December 17th, 1622. About three years later, as was the custom, they exhumed, exhumed the body and they found it intact. And a number of miracles apparently had also happened around his life, his, his body, his tomb. And also there was a, a sweet smell, a sweet fra fragrance, a sweet aroma that was emanating from his body. And those are the two signs he was a saint. It's understood to be a sign of holiness, but the actual procedure of declaring someone to be a saint may take many decades. They have a kind of a grassroots swell usually happens that people are insisting because of miracles and visions and things, other events, that there was something saintly about him, and it becomes part of the consciousness of the church, and then a formal declaration would be made by the Synod of Bishops to officially declare someone to have been a saint. In the case of St. Dionysius, it was 70 or 80 years later before he was officially recognized as a saint. In 1703, 81 years after the saint passed away, he was canonized by the Orthodox Church. If you go to Zakynthos, one of the first things you'll see is the Church of St. Dionysius. And in the Church of St. Dionysius, they have his body. When you approach the chapel, the Church of St. Dionysius, you walk in and the monks will come up there and they will open up the case so that you can see the body of St. Dionysius. However, many times that we've gone and we've taken young people there, it does not open. And the tradition is that when it does not open, that St. Dionysius is actually walking and healing those people around in the various areas of the village. In front of the tomb, of St. Dionysius where he lies physically. There's also slippers that are present. These slippers have to be changed periodically by the monks because they get worn out. Because of all the traveling that St. Dionysius does now in this life, presently, after he passed on. There's a special chamber to the right side of the altar and that's kind of like a coffin. And when pilgrims come, they open it and you see a kind of a glass case and his body inside and he's dressed as a bishop is dressed. Uh, it's not an airtight container because you can kiss his ankles. And you see that although he died in 1624, that his body is intact. It's very dark because the Turks at one point tried to burn it, tried to destroy it. During their occupation, they tried to demoralize the people, but they weren't able to do it. But still, the skin is on the body, and it's still soft, it's still supple. And it's a very powerful experience to go in and to venerate the remains of St. Dionysius. I've been to Zakynthos many times, but I think the most profound times I've been to Zakynthos is with the children of America that go to the Ionian village, a summer camp on the western coast of Greece, a camp that has a beachfront. The beachfront overlooks the island of Zakynthos in the distance. Children are taught about their faith at this camp, about their lives. But one of the most important aspects of the camp is a trip to the island of Zakynthos, 
to come face to face, most of them for the first time in their lives, with an actual saint. I've seen with my eyes miracles transformed. Not so much, even though we have seen people healed with our own eyes, but you see the lives of these young teenagers, these very, very vulnerable souls that are influenced by this saint forever. They come face to face, not only with a saint when they venerate the relics of Saint Theonisius, this 400 year old corpse that is intact, that is not decayed. They come more into direct relationship with their own faith. It becomes very much alive for them. This saint shows them that there is eternal life. In 1984, I was traveling with the Ionian Village Camp Group from the mainland of Kilini to the island of Zakynthos. We had about 50, 60 children on the boat, campers. And as we were traveling over, it's a two-hour boat trip from Kilini to the port of Zakynthos. And I fell asleep to really rest a little bit. And when we were docking, I woke up and I was very cold. And they took my temperature and I had 103 fever. Many of us tried to convince him to stay back at camp and to sleep because of the fever that he had and the great pain that he was in, but he made the trip with the young people. So I practically dragged myself from the boat to the monastery, the church, where St. Dionysius is, which is about a two-kilometer walk. And by the time I reached the steps, I was so exhausted, ready to pass out, that I sat on the steps while all the kids went inside. So as I was sitting on the steps, someone tapped me on the shoulder. And I looked up, and it was a monk, an old man. And I, he said to me, my son, you don't look well. And I said, Yerunda, which is the proper respect for calling these individuals. I said, I don't feel well, I'm very sick, I have a fever. And he said, listen, go inside, pray to the saint. They're about ready to open his casket, light a candle, venerate his feet, bless your cross, and we'll see what happens. That's what he told me, we'll see what happens. I walked up, it was my turn. I gave my cross to my spiritual father, Father Chris Kerhoulis. We collected all these crosses and Father John's was part of it. And the priest that was in charge of the, of the crypt opened the crypt, took all the crosses and placed them on the saint and did a small prayer service and returned the crosses to me because I was a priest. I gave all the crosses back to everybody and the last ones were mine and Father John's. I gave him his cross. And as I received my cross, I put it on and my cross burned me. Not in the painful burning, but it burned me. And I got very, very dizzy where they needed a couple of them to grab me before I fell down and they ushered me down to a chair, which was right by the lower steps of where the saint's um, casket is at. And I sat down and I almost passed out. And suddenly, not more than 10, 15, 20 seconds, something like that, I don't remember what it was, the fever was gone. I wasn't dizzy anymore. My strength was there. I was able to stand up and walk without the help of anyone. As I left the church with a number of campers around me, he tried to gain my attention. Upon gaining my attention, he says to me, look at me. And I said, don't worry about the campers, I've, I'm taking care of them. And he said, no, 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 look at me. And I said, oh, you look great. He was healed. I felt so compelled because it was the individual who helped me go in there, this monk, that I didn't, wouldn't have thought of it if this monk had not told me, go inside and pray to the saint. It's amazing how we take things for granted. We don't think of these things. And we need someone to help us usher us through that I wanted to give him something, you know, out of respect, because I know these people have nothing. So I took some drachmas and put it in an envelope, and I was trying to find him, and I couldn't find him. So I went to the priest of the church, and I asked him, you know, Father, please give this to the monk of the church here. And his response was totally amazing. He said, we have no one like that here. He said, no, I told him, no, someone outside helped me and told me that he's a monk here, and he told me to, uh, you know, to go inside. I wouldn't have done it if he didn't tell me. He says, we do not have anyone like that. Who was it? And I looked over and I looked up and I saw the icon of St. Dionysius and I said, it looked like him. And then I got a little startled. <laughs> but then I also felt at ease too because it goes to show us that no matter who we are, God is always willing to help us in times of need. The saint had healed him. A small miracle, but something that all the campers then were able to experience firsthand. 
the greatness of this incredible saint. Whether it was to forgive Father John for the many sins he had committed, or to make me realize about the sins that I am guilty of, I'm really not quite sure. But I know that the saint and his love uh, will, that will be an experience that I will never, ever, ever forget. When I look back now, it um, startles me, but also gives me a little comfort because it was one of the issues why I embraced the priesthood, that this event in my life that guided me toward this ministry. When I look at the icon of St. Dionysius, I think back to that day, and it reminds me of a very simple, pious, holy individual that cares about people, that loves people. And it brings me back to the issue of this old man tapping me on the shoulders and ushering me in, saying, go inside, and not thinking that I'm in front of a church and I'm not going in. And yet his words saying to me, go inside and let's see what happens. And I guess I went inside and I saw what happened. Yeah. 